Well, good morning. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to worship with you this morning, uh, the first Sunday in December, which means it is a communion Sunday. Uh, my name is Matt Hedlund. I'm the senior pastor here, and I invite you uh, to find some piece of bread or maybe a cracker in your home and uh, some wine or some grape juice or some kind of juice. We are going to be receiving communion together. If you don't want to do it at home, uh, from 11.30 to 12.30, out at the loading area, we're going to have a drive-through, and I will be wearing a mask and gloves, and I will hand you the communion kits that look very much like this in a sandwich bag for you to have. But I would love it if you were to receive with us so that we can do it as a community of faith here this morning. David, what are you doing on Tuesday night? Okay, David says he's busy on Tuesday night. That's probably because that's the next concert in our concert, concert series, David Hine and Friends. And uh, I've been told... What's that? I don't know if you could hear him. He says, it turns out he has friends, but all his friends are here. So it's going to be folks from our own congregation who are going to be the friends part of the David Hine and Friends. And this upcoming Saturday, let's pray for, for wonderful weather we have an outdoor nativity that is going to be uh, there for us. We're going to have live animals out there um, right on that busy, busy street. So we'll get a lot of, of uh, people seeing that, that we are celebrating this season in the right way. But our United Methodist women are also going to offer another cookie crawl. They had such success with their cookie crawl uh, several weeks ago and want to continue to help make a difference for the mission and ministry uh, that, we have, that we offer here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. And so we seek to be faithful to all the generations. And so I invite you to receive this video offering of a children's time with Miss Christie. Good morning. Today is the second Sunday in Advent. Advent is the time when we remember the gifts that God has given us as we get ready for the birth of Jesus. Today's gift is the gift of love. Long before Jesus, God's people were crying out for comfort, and God promised it to them. He promised that a good shepherd would come, one who would care for all of us. And guess what? The angels came first to the shepherds. Think about that. When the good news of Jesus' birth came, it came first to the shepherds. God wanted us to remember his promise. He was sending us a good shepherd. Jesus was coming. He would share God's love with the whole world. So this week, remember to think about how much God loves you and how he kept his promise to send the good shepherd. Have a great week. I love you. Please join me in the call to worship. Alleluia, the Christ child comes, and we await his birth. Let us throw off our distractions and allow the chaos to settle. Let us watch for the signs and listen to the messengers. Let us stand on tiptoe and, and shout aloud and sing. sing. Hope is in the air. Peace is promised. Joy is on the tips of our tongues. And, and love is coming. Love, love divine, all loves excelling. We are waiting on love, and love is waiting on us.
Last week, on the very first Sunday of Advent, we began the annual tradition of the Advent wreath. And last week, we heard the message of hope. And at this service, in this week, uh, second week, we're going to light the candle of love. And so we have the Rice family to help us in this. Out of darkness, light shines. This light points us to the one whose love overcame the darkness of this world, whose love will be our light in the world to come. As we wait for Christ to return, we can see his love grow. Today we light the candle of love because we know that Jesus is love. The love of God flows through the gift of the Christ child into our lives. As we grow, we realize how much we need Christ's love and are called to share that love with others. Let us pray. Dear God, we love you because we know that in Jesus you loved us first. As we light this candle, help us love each other more and more, and help us tell the whole world about the love of Jesus. Amen. So we have hope. And what's the source of our hope? The love of God. A love that shines brightly in and through all of God's children. And so our Advent wreath is halfway complete. But we still wait. We wait with anticipation that God's promises will be fulfilled. This is the truth sent from above. The truth of God. have an opportunity at this time to go to our God in prayer. I want to thank you for all the ways in which you continue to pray with us and pray for us, your willingness to continue to text in your items of joy or concern so that we as a community of faith truly can minister to one another. And so hear this call to prayer. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And so we turn to God in a time of silent and listening prayer. Let us pray. God of love, God of holy comfort, God of abundant mercy. You have given us grace to pray with one heart and with one voice, even though our hearts are broken and our voices tremble with grief and sorrow. Comfort, comfort, Lord, your holy people. Comfort those of us who sit in darkness, mourning beneath our sorrows, Lord. And so hear us, Lord. Hear us as we lift up our prayers to you. Here are the prayers of the people. We pray for all of the members of our congregation, family and friends, who serve in the United States military. We especially lift up prayers this week for a safe deployment for Mike Webster, Susie and Tom Webster's son. Prayers for the kind love resembling Jesus Christ's suffering on our behalves and for the sacrificial love in action from all of us. Prayers of gratitude for those on staff who have done much to keep us connected to worship during the pandemic. Prayers for a smooth transition into a new job this week, and prayers of gratefulness that a new job has been going well for the five past weeks. A prayer of joy as Maggie Wagner Ozziak along with her husband, Mike, and two-year-old son, Owen, welcome their second child this week, Estelle Glow Oziak, the granddaughter of Ginny and Roy Wagner. Praise be to God. Prayers for Marilyn Stuckey, scheduled to have heart surgery tomorrow, December 7th. And for Janet Hartzell, who had a successful knee surgery. May her healing continue to be swift. Prayers for Sue Krasowski as she recovers from pneumonia and other difficulties. We hope she can come home from the hospital yet today. Prayers for families battling cancer. For Jim after emergency surgery and for the Dunleavy family for the loss of Linda to cancer at just age 59. Prayers of gratitude for the gloriously, beautifully decorated church. And finally, a prayer and a cry for help. Dear God and Jesus, Please help with depression and feelings of loneliness that I can't seem to shake. These are the prayers of our people today. God of love, God of divine comfort, God of abundant mercy, speak to us of the peace that awaits us, of the balm of healing for our weary and wounded souls. We ask all this trusting in the promise you have made to hear the prayers of two or three who have gathered in the name of your holy child, Jesus, who we call the Christ. Amen. And so we come to the point of the service each week where we really are challenged to explore the ways in which we continue to be faithful stewards of all the blessings that God has given us. I want to thank all of you who are continuing to send in your checks, continuing to, 
to bring in food items and the tools for habitat and all the ways in which you are giving of yourself. And so as we are contemplating our stewardship, why don't we receive this musical offering? Thank you very much. That was, that was beautiful. I hope it translated through the uh, live stream so you could have had the same experience we had in here.
Well, we are in our second week in a sermon series, an Advent sermon series called People Get Ready. And you know, when I look at my neighborhood, I see people are doing exactly that. I'm sure my neighborhood's not the only one where there are lights on almost every single home. Some of the yards have giant inflatable Santas and reindeer and, and snowmen and and you got to keep your head on a swivel driving through our neighborhoods right now with all the Amazon trucks and FedEx trucks and UPS trucks. People are trying to get ready for Christmas. But this sermon series, People Get Ready, is not about the busyness nor the business of Christmas. No, we're seeking to get ready to truly once again celebrate, to truly receive the God of love, the God of hope, the God of peace, the God that gives us joy that came to us through Emmanuel. This is a season of spiritual preparation. Last week, we began the sermon series with some scripture lessons that were clearly written by people who were fed up. They had had enough. They were crying out to God, God, come down here and help us out. And so that was our cry. God, please come down. It was a cry that God would come to revive us, to restore us, to redeem us. And the good news is, with our gospel eyes, because we know how the book ends, we know that God did come down. But what does that mean for us? It means we are loved. It means we are redeemed. And it means that we have a path to comfort. A path to comfort. The kind of comfort that only God can give. Within the scripture lessons that were assigned for churches around the nation, those who are using the lectionary, this week is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. And in my study Bible, the heading in this section says, God's people are comforted. And so hear these words from the prophet, the prophet who is a mouthpiece for Almighty God. The prophet writes, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The mother, I love that. He will feed his flock like a shepherd and gather up the lambs in his arms. Psalmist in Psalm 85 says this, Show us your steadfast love, O Lord. Grant us your salvation. Let me hear what, the God, what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. 
Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. A path for his steps. A highway given to us by the Lord. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yesterday morning, I was out at Wisconsin Memorial Cemetery for a service of celebration of life, a service of death and resurrection for Bob Plaster. Bob and Jenny have been a part of this community of faith for decades and decades. They raised their, 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 their sons here. Bob was a man of deep faith, and he passed away peacefully. Why was he able to do that? Why did he have a sense of comfort He had that peace because of his faith. Because of his faith. He knew that he was going to transition, be born into eternity. And so his very last words to his family were very meaningful. You ever wonder what your last words might be? Hopefully it's not some kind of an expletive because you're about to get in trouble or something. His final words were to his family, don't ever lose your faith. Don't ever lose your faith. He was a man of faith. And he, he confided in his kids that at 89 years old, in the midst of this dying process, he for the first time really witnessed, he, 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 he spoke of his faith to somebody who was not a part of his immediate family. Even in the face of death, he was experiencing the kind of comfort that God is speaking to us through that 40th chapter of Isaiah. Comfort, oh comfort my people. Now we know that the seeds of comfort and hope may take root in the soil of adversity. When your life seems to be falling apart, simply ask God for comfort. You may not escape adversity, but you may find God's comfort as you are facing it. Sometimes, and maybe this is what Bob knew, sometimes the only comfort we have is in the knowledge that someday we will be with God that we will appreciate the comfort and encouragement that is found in God's word, in God's presence, in God's people. Bob had experiences in what I call a thin place where he was already able to catch a glimpse of what was in front of him, to see people, to see the Savior saying, come to me, these thin places. He died as a man who was thankful and who was blessed. And friends, I want to tell you, I have seen it with my own eyes. There is a real difference in transitioning into eternity for people of faith compared to those who have no faith. The difference is the comfort of God's grace and eternal life. Now, many of you have been to visitations, and and we know that there is always a little card that has the name of the person, their, their dates of birth and death, and then usually an image or some kind of thing, and I don't know if Mary uh, can get in really close on this. The card that the Plaster family chose is an image of Jesus as a shepherd with a flock all about him with the small and weak sheep in his arms, in his arms. This is the kind of image that the prophets spoke about long before Jesus ever came to earth. The prophet Ezekiel says, I will give you a shepherd from the family of my servant, King David. All of you, both strong and weak, will have the same shepherd, and he will take good care of you. He will be your leader, and I will be your God. I, the Lord, have spoken. And that classic psalm that we read at almost every single funeral, the 23rd psalm, begins very simply with, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I truly, truly need. Shepherds, shepherds. We don't see a lot of shepherds in our uh, country here. We know that some do exist, but I know that when I was in Israel, there's still Bedouin shepherds that are still tending to their flocks in in the hillsides. Max Licato is a pastor and an author, and I love his little devotionals that he puts out. But one of my favorite ones begins with this line from Lakato: Behold a hero of the West, the cowboy. 
And he goes on to say, he rears his horse to a stop at the rim of the canyon. He shifts his weight in his saddle, weary from the cattle trail. One finger pushes his hat up his head. One jerk of the kerchief reveals a sun-leathered face. A thousand cattle pass behind him, a thousand miles of trail before him. A thousand women would love him and to hold him, but none do, none will, because he lives to drive cattle, and he drives cattle to live. He's honest in poker and quick with a gun, hard riding, slow talking, and his best friend is his horse, and his strength is his grit. He needs no one. He is a cowboy, an American hero. And I, when I was young, I, I, I liked to... Be, pretend to be a cowboy. As a matter of fact, this is a bit of a confession. A lot of men uh, aren't secure enough to make a confession like this, but I played with dolls when I was uh, uh, a little boy. And you know that little boys don't call them dolls. We call them what? Action figures. And I had about a foot tall Johnny West action figure that I used to play with. And I had a black Bart and I had, I had all these different uh, things. And I used to play, uh, you know, as a cowboy, a cowboy. And to this day, I still love Westerns, an old John Wayne movie or a, a Clint Eastwood spaghetti western. Cowboys as heroes. Flawed, yes. Tough, yes. But a hero. Well, Locato says, yes, behold a hero, a cowboy. But then he also says, behold a hero in the Bible, a shepherd. On the surface, he appears similar to the cowboy. He, too, is rugged. He sleeps where the jackals howl and works where the wolves prowl. The shepherd's never off duty, always alert. Like the cowboy, he makes his roof, the stars, and the pasture his home. But we know, friends, that that's where the similarities end. You see, the shepherd loves his sheep. It's not that the cowboy doesn't appreciate the cows or the cattle. He just doesn't know the animal. He doesn't even want to know the animal. Have you ever seen a picture of a cowboy caressing a cow? Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen a picture of a shepherd caring for a sheep? Why the difference? Don't overthink it. The cowboy leads the cow, leads the herd to slaughter whereas the shepherd leads the sheep to be shorn. The cowboy wants the meat of the cow. The shepherd wants the wool of the sheep. And so they treat their animals differently. The cowboy drives the cattle, the shepherd leads. The, the herd has dozens of cowboys, the flock has one shepherd. The cowboy wrestles, brands, herds, and ropes. The shepherd leads, guides, feeds, and anoints. The cowboy knows the name of the trail hands. The shepherd knows the name of the sheep. The cowboy hoops and hollers at the cows. The shepherd calls each sheep by name. I think it's a really good thing that Jesus identified himself as a good shepherd instead of a good cowboy. And yet we know that for many, God is perceived as a cowboy hard-faced, square-jawed ranch hand from heaven who drives his church against its will to places it doesn't really even want to go. But that's the wrong image. Jesus called himself the good shepherd, and the shepherd who knows his sheep by name and lays his life down for them, the shepherd who protects, provides, and possesses his sheep. Jesus understood his role as shepherd. Jesus understood the words of the prophets about what kind of a Messiah he was supposed to be. Matthew says it this way in chapter 9, verses 35 and 36. Jesus went to every town and village. He taught in their meeting places and preached the good news about God's kingdom. Jesus also healed every kind of disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt sorry for them. They were confused and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And so in John's gospel, in Jesus' own words, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives up his life for his sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Well, now, that kind of imagery of, of shepherd would have been a very familiar one to the people he was speaking to. 
Some scholars estimate that 80% of Jesus' listeners made their living off of the land and that many of them were indeed shepherds. They lived out in the fields with the sheep. No flock ever grazed without a shepherd and no shepherd was ever off duty. When the sheep wandered, the shepherd found them. When they fell, he carried them. When they were hurt, he healed them. Jesus tells a story about the shepherd leaving the 99 to find the one that has gotten lost. And we, like that lost sheep, have gone astray time and time again. You see, sheep aren't smart. They tend to wander into running creeks for water, then their wool grows heavy and they drown. They need a shepherd to lead them to the still waters, as the psalmist says. They have no natural defenses, do sheep. No claws, no horns, no fangs. And isn't that a good thing? What a scary animal that would be. No, no, they have none of that. They are helpless. They need a shepherd with a rod and a walking stick to protect them. They have no sense of direction. They need someone to lead them on the paths that are right, the righteous paths. And so do we. You and I, all of us, we too tend to be swept away by waters we should have avoided. We have no defense against the evil lion who prowls about seeking who he might devour. We too get lost. We have all wandered astray. Each of us has gone his own way. We need a shepherd, not a cowboy to hurt us. We need a shepherd to care for us and to guide us, and we have one. And the one we have knows us by name. The path is there. Our God seeks to comfort us. The Bible says God draws near to the crushed in spirit. We have been given the one good shepherd, born basically in a first century barn with animals nearby. And among the very first to greet Emmanuel, God with us, were the shepherds who instantly worshipped the true good shepherd. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says our God. And so God draws near. God comes to give us a sense of hope. But out of God's love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to be the good shepherd, to lay down his life for us. In the very end of the Bible, in the Revelation, we hear these words. I heard a loud shout from the throne God's home is now with his people. He will live with them and they will be his own. Yes, God will make his home among his people. He will wipe all their tears from their eyes and there will be no more death, suffering, crying, or pain. These things of the past are gone forever. And that is very comforting news. And so, in light of the God of love, who seeks to comfort, who makes the, play, the, 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 route, the road plain. To him, we are drawn to this table for a feast unlike any other feast. And so why don't we call ourselves to communion in this Advent season. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. Prophets who looked for the day when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That day when nations shall not lift up sword against nation and neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. 
He put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and comfort all who are in need. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took some bread. He took some bread. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Part your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and those gathered with us virtually. Part your Holy Spirit on these gifts of the bread and the wine. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And so we pray together the prayer that our good shepherd, who comes to comfort, who comes to redeem, Jesus taught us these words, and so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen the body of Christ our Lord, take and eat. And the cup of blessing for the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting, take and drink. Almighty God, we give you thanks for all the ways in which you have blessed us. Lord, empower us to be the people you need us to be. Amen. And so we continue in our worship service this day with a hymn, or no, 30 seconds of music.
And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, take comfort. Take comfort because God has come down. God, out of God's love for all of humanity, has come down and taken our flesh. And we anticipate celebrating that fully this Christmas and every single day thereafter. Have a blessed week. And if you want to stop by for the next half hour and receive a, a drive through communion, I'll be right out in front there at the loading center. May God bless you all. Amen.